What's happening, all you hip, cool cats? My name is Kit. This is Americans Learn. And we are once again joining our boy, our main man, our ace in the hole, Napoleon, who is going dynamite in Italy. He is getting ready to continue on with his campaign. Napoleon in Italy. Battle for... Rivoli. I hope I hope I said it right. I hope I said it right. So uh, we've been checking out this epic video series by Epic History TV. So do me a favor, you hip cool cats. Do the right thing. Do the correct thing. And support Epic History. They have done phenomenal work. Attention to detail and so much more uh, for their channel. Uh, they have a lot of great content. So as a favor for me, do the right thing. Be the awesome people that I know you all are. And support the original content creators. But now let's get our learn on. Check out the battle maps and march side by side with Napoleon Bonaparte as he begins his career as not only the greatest general, but soon to become Imperator of France. So grab yourself a tasty snack and a tasty beverage and let's play this video in a three, a two, a one. An Epic History TV PMF Productions collaboration. In 1796, at the height of the French Revolutionary Wars, a young French general took charge of a ragged, demoralized army in northern Italy. It was his first command. Many expected him to fail. Instead, in just, just one month, he won his first brilliant campaign. As he With astonishing self-confidence, boldness and energy, he led his army to victory after victory. Transforming the war in Europe, winning praise from a grateful republic, and forging a legend. This is the story of Napoleon Bonaparte's first campaign, and the dawn of a new age. Outstanding. And I have to say, there's a lot of stuff I didn't know about Napoleon Bonaparte. Uh, and this video has done a lot of great things, especially, uh, or the previous videos, showing the battle maps and the tactics that uh, Napoleon was using to outwit his opponents uh, in this horrific, well, obviously this campaign must have been very horrific. I mean, the amount of strength to march in formation, to hold those muskets and fire, and then receive a volley fire towards yourself, it's rather concerning it's i i don't think i have the courage to do that but let's let's all pretend that we do january 1797 a new year but familiar problems for 27 year old general bonaparte waging war against the austrians in northern italy he has the great fortress city of mantua under siege and after a narrow victory at Arcole, he's once again driven back the Austrian armies, trying to march to its aid. But the French army of Italy is in a ragged state. Troops have not been paid for weeks. Their uniforms are disintegrating. Their shoes are broken. <laughs> like, hey, Napoleon, we, we, we love you, man. But I ain't got no shoes. My feet are about to retire. And above all, they're hungry. Yeah, they would be. One of Napoleon's major concerns is the wretched state of medical care for his men. The hospitals lack everything. Our wounded are lying on the floors and in the most horrible state of destitution. It's not just a question of saving lives and getting wounded men back to their units. Medical care affects morale. As troops going into combat want to know that if the worst happens, they'll be looked after. Conditions are much worse for the Austrian garrison of Mantua, commanded by Field Marshal Wurmser. Four months of siege, 9,000 soldiers have died from disease, wounds, or the effects of malnutrition. Survivors live off horse meat, 
civilians off rats and dogs. Even these miserable rations will run out by the 27th of January, just a few weeks away. The clock is ticking. The Austrians must relieve Mantua by that date, or lose the city, and with it, the war in Italy. True. Right, so it's a matter of who's going to get what first. Napoleon, having received just 7,000 reinforcements, prepares to meet Alvinci's advance. He will not only be outnumbered, he doesn't know where his enemy will strike. And Napoleon must hold one division back to cover Wormser's garrison. It's commanded once more by General Serrurier, recovered from his long illness. Welcome back, General. Augereau's division watches the Adige, while Massena guards Verona. The Northern Division has a new commander. Napoleon has sacked Vaubois for his poor performance and put in his place General Barthélemy Joubert. He is a hardworking, brave, and exceptionally modest commander, and like Napoleon, just 27 years old. General Ray is in reserve south of Lake Garda. General Alvinci has received 14,000 reinforcements and orders to relieve Mantua as soon as possible. He is eager to march, but heavy snow and the late arrival of equipment and supplies delays his advance until the 7th of January. The first columns on the move are Provera and... I really gotta love the music. I mean, come on. Who doesn't love this music and the, and the, and this, the intensity of the situation? It's gonna be a total -to slug match between the French Republic, which will soon become the French Empire, against the Austrian Empire. Berlich. But their offensive is merely a diversion intended to draw Napoleon's attention away from the main threat, which will be coming down the Adige Valley. Oh. Alvinci has divided this force into six columns. Their mission is to envelop and destroy Joubert's division at Rivoli and clear the path to Mantua. But Rivoli is a strong defensive position. They must hit it hard and fast before the French can respond. Napoleon, assuming any Austrian advance is still weeks away, has traveled to the Papal States with a column of troops commanded by Colonel Lann. They intend to put a little pressure on the Pope, who continues to stir opposition to France. God damn it, Pope, you're being a real prick. However, as soon as he receives reports of enemy movement, Napoleon races back to his headquarters at Rovabella. By now, Alvinci's forces have also begun to advance, but serious planning failures quickly emerge. Lusignan's first column, on the right flank of the advance, has orders to cross the slopes of Monte Baldo and attack Joubert from the rear. It's soon clear that these orders are wildly optimistic, dreamed up by staff officers who'd not seen the terrain. The peak of Monte Baldo is more than 7,000 feet high. So wait, you're telling a whole bunch of men, troops, soldiers, who need to carry weapons, am ammunition, their uniforms, supplies, the cl Listen, only one person was crazy enough to walk through the Alps to invade Italy. Okay, his name was Hannibal, a man who was a fan of animals. And uh, yeah, he, he was able to do that. But that was many, 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 many years ago. Um, so, Austrian High Command, who is giving these orders? 
high. Its slopes are covered in deep snow and ice. Dumb. The paths are treacherous, even more so after dark, and there is no firewood for making camp. Only by taking a wide detour can Lusignan make any progress at all, yeah. whilst losing 200 men to exhaustion and exposure. Meanwhile, the second and third Austrian columns reach the French outpost at Ferrara. An initial attack is repulsed, and following their orders, they wait for Lusignan's column to appear before launching a second attack. However, Lusignan's column is not yet in sight. Alvinci's plan relies on swift, bold action. But just 48 hours in, it's falling apart. It is. Goofy. I can't... I cannot think it was prudent to adopt a plan which, at this season, a fall of snow might render totally impractical. Colonel Thomas Graham, British observer with the Austrian army. At Roverbella, Napoleon ponders the incoming reports. He knows that Joubert's forward outpost is under attack at Ferrara that Massena has repulsed an Austrian attack on Verona, and Augereau faces a sizeable Austrian force near Legnago, poised to cross the Adige. Is Alvinci using the same tactics as before, making his attack from the east? No. Then, a second report arrives from Joubert. His scouts have detected an enemy column marching around his flank. He has no doubt that he faces a major Austrian attack and has begun withdrawing his forces to Rivoli. The report I have given you is exact, he tells his chief. Be assured, the enemy will make every effort to throw me onto the blockade of Mantua. The enemy's plan has been unmasked, Napoleon announces, and issues a flurry of orders. Massena is to march immediately to reinforce Joubert. Augereau is to send him cavalry and guns, while the rest of his division keeps watch on Provera. Ray is to move up to Castelnuovo. That's right. Servurier is to be on high alert for an attempted breakout by the Mantua garrison. While Joubert, the youngest and least experienced of Napoleon's divisional commanders, Must hold. is instructed to hold Rivoli at hold. any cost. Hold. and assured that help is on the way. Hold the line. After giving the Austrians a bloody nose at Ferrara, Joubert has extricated his troops overnight and taken up a defensive position around Rivoli. Napoleon arrives around midnight and immediately sets out with Joubert to inspect the enemy's positions. The weather had cleared and the moonlight was superb. I climbed the different heights and observed the lines of enemy fires. They filled the country between the Adige and Lake Garda, and the atmosphere was ablaze with them. One could easily distinguish five camps, each composed of a column. Until reinforcements arrive, Napoleon has just Joubert's division, 10,000 men to hold off 24,000 Austrians. But Alvinci will help to even the odds by ordering Lusignan's first column to attempt a wide outflanking march no. to cut off the French line of retreat. And Napoleon decides the main road to Rivoli, which passes through a steep defile known as the Pontari, can be held by a single regiment supported by entrenched cannon. Okay. This leaves more manageable odds 
of 9,000 against 12,000 in the centre. But Napoleon wants to push out his defensive line, to hold the slopes that mark the edge of the Rivoli Plateau. Exactly. At 4am, General Vial's Light Infantry Brigade advances through the darkness. They drive back the Austrian outposts and take the San Marco Chapel. They're followed on their left by the rest of Joubert's division. But the French... There'll be the devil on the high ground. The devil! ...push too far. Skirmishes break out along the line with heavy fighting on the heights of San Marco. Napoleon had not wanted to start the battle so early, but the combat escalates. Come on, At hold dawn, the line. The Austrians attack the plateau in force. The French 85th hold. Demi Brigade is outflanked and routed by Lipte's second column. The 29th Light, on its right, is forced to retreat it looks like the French line is crumbling. But the 14th, on their right, fights tenaciously. Come on. It's an intense infantry battle across broken ground, vineyards and walled gardens, with sudden charges, hurried withdrawals and counter-charges. When the Austrians overrun a French battery, an officer demands, 14th! Will you let them take your guns? Never. His troops mount a ferocious charge that routs the Austrians and reclaims the battery. By 9am, Massena's troops have begun to arrive. They take up position on Joubert's left. The buckled French line is stabilised. But so far, the French have only faced half of Alvinci's six columns. Oh, no. One by one, the others now join the action. Vukasovic's sixth column is on the far side of the Adige River. But its guns cause havoc among French troops holding the Pontari. Under this covering fire, Royce's fifth column charges up the narrow road and in fierce fighting, storms the French entrenchments. This advance threatens the entire French right wing with encirclement. Man, this is like stirring up a hornet's nest. Holy cow. And a retreat begins. Moments later, gunfire to the southwest reveals Lusignan's first column has reached Affy, poised to cut off their escape. The French situation is desperate. They are outnumbered, surrounded, and under heavy attack. Napoleon's staff look anxiously to their commander, wondering what miracle can save the army now. And? All looks towards General Bonaparte. But after a short inspection, he limited himself to saying calmly, they are ours. Holy cow. <laughs> to be there and hear those words like, well, we got them? Sensing victory, General Alvinci and his staff ride forward to urge his infantry on. Napoleon remains calm. He knows Alvinci's centre columns are near exhaustion and that they have no cavalry and little artillery support. He identifies Royce's column as the most immediate threat and orders Joubert to send every man and gun he can spare for a counterattack. General Leclerc and a 21-year-old Captain Lasalle then charge Charts. the entire French cavalry just a few hundred horsemen. Under this onslaught, the lead Austrian troops are driven back into the gorge. Here, they collide with the rest of the column coming up, 
cavalry and infantry jammed together, some pushing forward, others trying to escape. Uh, there must be Joubert's madness. Men pour fire down on them from the overlooking ridge. The final straw is the devastating explosion of an ammunition wagon. That must have been so shocking, but looking back, I could see some soldier. Hey, remember that wagon blew up? Austrian morale breaks. The survivors flood back down the road to safety. Napoleon now turns his full attention to the center, where the exhausted Austrian columns have become spread out and disordered. The sudden appearance of French cavalry, supported by infantry and guns, sparks panic and a mass rout. Alvinci, who must have thought himself on the cusp of victory moments before, must join in an undignified race to the rear, spreading further alarm among his men. By 1 p.m., the bulk of the Austrian army is in headlong retreat. <laughs> but wait, what about the other Austrian forces? Because they're all in the retreat now. Let's find Lucignon's out. Lusignan's first column in an awkward position. Completely isolated, he begins a fighting withdrawal. But the arrival of General Ray's brigade in his rear triggers a rout. Fewer than half of his 4,000 men escape. Wow. Through tenacity, courage, and good fortune, the army of Italy has turned a grim situation into an astonishing triumph. <laughs> French casualties are modest. Austrian losses. Still, 2,000. 2,200 souls, 1,000 prisoners, I Are devastating. Over the next few days, 5,000 more Austrians are captured as they struggle back through the mountain passes. Napoleon will not be there to see it. He's received news that Provera has crossed the Adige and is marching on Mantua. It is a chance for him to strike one more blow against the enemy and to seal the fate of Mantua. You are truly the spoiled child of victory. Leaving Joubert in command at Rivoli with orders to renew the attack at dawn Napoleon races south with Massena's division. Provera has no clue of the disaster that's engulfed Alvinci's army, nor that the wolves now gather for him. He pushes on to Mantua, shadowed by Ogero, who snaps up his rearguard, 2,000 men taken prisoner. With just 7,000 left, Provera's only hope is to break through the French siege lines. First, he tries to attack San Giorgio. Formidable French defenses and a powerful cannonade stop him cold. The next day, he launches a coordinated attack with Wormser against French forces at La Favorita. Oh no. But Napoleon has now arrived with Massena's division from the north. It's over. Wormser's weak, starving men are forced back into the citadel, while a determined charge by the 57th Demi Brigade smashes into Provera's flank. Oh, they're done. With Augereau approaching from the east, Provera faces impossible odds and surrenders with his entire force. Oh. Wormser's last hope of rescue has been crushed. 
he puts off the inevitable for two agonising weeks. Until, with all food exhausted, he finally accepts terms for Mantua's surrender on the 2nd of February. He and an escort will return to Austria. His 16,000 remaining troops become prisoners. Austrian losses in the campaign reach a staggering 44,000 men. After eight months, the Siege of Mantua is over. A victory that will soon be celebrated on the streets of Paris. But it is General Serrurier, not Napoleon, who takes the formal Austrian surrender. His commander-in-chief has already departed to take on his next opponent, the Pope. Everything that is beautiful in Italy, with the exception of a small number of objects in Turin and Naples. From Rome, Pope Pius VI has once more been agitating against the French. And so Napoleon marches south with 9,000 men to explain the new realities of power in Italy. That's right, Pope. You're about to get a smack in the mouth. At Faenza, General Victor's division sweeps aside papal forces, and Ancona is taken without a fight. The subsequent Treaty of Tolentino forces the Pope to give up Romagna, as well as 30 million francs and a hundred works of art. Done. Belatedly, Napoleon's victories persuade the Directory to back him in force. French armies stuck on the Rhine are ordered to send him reinforcements. Their 34-year-old commander, another rising star of the French army, is congratulated on his brilliant winter crossing of the Alps. His name is General Jean Bernadotte. Jean Bernadotte. On the 10th of March, with 70,000 confident, seasoned troops under his command, Napoleon goes on the offensive. He sends Joubert to invade the Tyrol, Massena to advance up the Piave Valley, while he leads the bulk of the army on the most direct road to Vienna. The enemy is scattered and demoralised. Even the appointment of a new commander, the Emperor's own brother, Archduke Charles, fails to restore morale. Sorry, Archduke, you gotta fly up out of here. Charles is regarded as a military prodigy. He's two years younger than Napoleon, and has defeated the armies of both General Jourdan and Moreau in Germany. But he does not have enough troops or time. He fights a delaying action at the Taliamento River. But it ends in disaster when Bernadotte surrounds and captures 2,000 Austrians, 10 guns, and eight standards. It's over. No, <clears throat> you gotta know when to hold them and know when to fold them. The French pursuit continues, with Massena covering Napoleon's northern flank. He arrives at Tarvis in time to block the Austrians' retreat. In three days' fighting, the French take another 3,000 prisoners. Napoleon's troops outmarch and outfight the Austrians at every turn. But his situation is more precarious than it seems. The other French armies are only just crossing the Rhine, while his own supply lines are now overextended and vulnerable. Rather than withdraw, Napoleon continues to advance, while proposing to Archduke Charles that they open peace negotiations. The Austrians accept. You know, I know this joke's being played out already, but that's what you call dynamite, Napoleon. Two days later, both sides agree an armistice, and peace talks begin at Leoben. After five years of conflict, 
Napoleon's dazzling advance into Austria has brought the War of the First Coalition to an end. Well done. So ends Napoleon's first campaign, almost exactly a year after it began, 380 miles away on the shores of the Mediterranean. Ah, uh, that's, that's what you call that Sigma energy right there. The Alpha Giga Chad Sigma Supreme. Negotiations at Leoben become the basis for the Treaty of Campo Formio, signed five months later. The Austrian Netherlands, roughly modern Belgium, formally passed to France. The Venetian Republic, invaded and systematically looted by Napoleon's troops, is divided between France and Austria. So ends the 1200-year history of the Serene Republic of Venice. The Republic is no more. The light of the world has died this day. The famous horses of St. Mark are among its many treasures dispatched to the Louvre in Paris to join its rapidly expanding Italian collection. All right, my fellow Italians, it seems like we got to go ahead and uh, go into France and start robbing it. The French part of Venice joins its other Italian client states to form a new Cisalpine Republic. The author of its constitution, Napoleon Bonaparte. <laughs> it's an illustration of how far the 27-year-old general has come in just a year. Having waged one of the most brilliant military campaigns in history, many would say... I, I just gotta love this picture right here. Like, he's talking to his soldiers, and this guy's just right, hey, look, man. I wear no shoes. His best. He now dictates terms to kings and popes, summons new states into being, and nurtures his status as the most celebrated military commander in Europe. He has achieved all this thanks to formidable intelligence, relentless hard work, and inspiring leadership which he has used to forge a unique bond of trust with his men. He's had luck, too, along the way, and been ably served by a group of brilliant officers, many of whom will be with him for years to come. Oh, he'll also become Grand Marshals. I just can't wait till we get to Ney! Do you not know who I am? Are you not the god? For Napoleon still has many extraordinary things to achieve. His Italian campaign is just the first chapter in one of the most astonishing lives in history. Did you know the Epic History TV merch store has a range of Napoleonic posters, t-shirts, hoodies, mugs and stickers? Bestsellers include a map of Napoleon's empire at its height, a poster featuring all 26 of Napoleon. It's my boy, Marshal Ney. Ney. Ah, uh, executed age 46 in Paris. R.I.P., brother. From the window to the wall, R.I.P. All right, what can, what can we take away from this? What can we learn? Don't mess around with Napoleon. He was serious about this. Dead serious. Definitely serious. So we're not playing screw around anymore. Until then, folks, we're going to be continuing on. In fact, if this is what you want to see more of, type, type, type in the comment section below, and we'll push forward to checking out more of Napoleon's campaign, which is dynamite. I'll see all of you hip cool cats on the flip side. Take good care of yourselves, and please be sure to support Epic History TV. They have done phenomenal work. You know... I like to make some humorous notes here and there, but I think I was just awestruck just at the amount of speed Napoleon was able not only to defeat the Austrian Empire, 
but also put in check the Pope and the various city-states in Italy. These five videos are a prelude of things to come. And if you want to see more of this, we got to hear your feedback. Until then, drink water, stay safe, and be like Napoleon. Be dynamite.